and everything going here, on me, Facebook. Um, uh, so can they see us now? Yeah, so we're live on Zoom. Hello, everyone. Getting Facebook set up, maybe. Cool, looks like everything's working. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to an evening of the Cascade Volcano Safety with Portland Mountain Rescue, hosted virtually by the Mountain Shop. Tonight, we're joined by Micah Hoover and Paige Bacher, who will be exploring the features, hazards, and all things safety surrounding the climbing of our nearest peaks. Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, and Mount Hood are perfect weekend adventures and are oftentimes brushed off as easy climbs. Spend this evening exploring the characteristics of Mount Adams and the specific hazards that have led to search and rescue missions in the past. Equip yourself, equip yourself with the essential knowledge of how to safely enjoy these beautiful Cascade Volcanoes. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to PMR. Go ahead, Paige, take it away. All right, thanks Liz for that introduction. Um, like Liz said, my name is Paige, I'm with PMR, and below me on my screen, on your screen it might be different, I know Zoom's all, oh, now he's over here. This is Micah Hoover, and we're both okay. with um, PMR, which is Portland Mountain Rescue. And we are a mountain rescue unit that specializes in search and rescue operations involving high angle rock, snow, and ice. Um, we work mainly with the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. So most of our operations take place on the south side of Mount Hood and on the um, west side of Mount Hood and then in the steeper areas of the gorge. Occasionally we are asked to work with other counties to um, do various other search and rescue operations, including on Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, and even as far south as Mount Shasta. Um, even though our high profile is search and rescue, 50% or half of our mission is dedicated to outreach and safety education. The Mountain Shop has been very generous in partnering with us to host these safety talks, and we're very grateful for that. Unfortunately, we've had to suspend these for the past couple of months, mainly due to the stay at home order by the governor's office. Um, since those orders have been listed, people have been out recreating. And so we figured it's timely to go ahead and start these safety talks again to make sure that you're as safe as you can be when you're recreating out um, on public lands. This particular talk is about Mount Adams. Um, and the way that we're gonna break this talk up is I'm gonna take the first half and I'm gonna talk about route um, gear, um, more specifics about the route, um, what you need to take with you, that kind of stuff. And then I'm going to hand it over to Micah and he's going to talk about hazards, um, how not to get in a search and rescue situation, and then what to do if you are in a search and rescue situation. Um, I am going to ask that um, we're still in a global pandemic and even though it's you know perfectly fine to go out and recreate, I'm going to ask that you, we are going to ask that you recreate conservatively um, because it does put search and rescue personnel at risk to go on missions. Um, it's very really difficult to socially distance when we're on missions. We will come get you, don't worry, don't feel ashamed, um, but just try to be conservative in your choices and make good decisions. So like I said, this presentation is on Mount Adams and even though I don't consider myself an expert on Mount Adams, I spend most of my time on Mount Hood doing training, um, climbing. Mount Adams is actually very dear to my heart. It was my first Cascade Volcano that I climbed 12 years ago, and it was quite the experience for me. Um, I didn't actually go back to Mount Adams until year before last when Mike and I uh, climbed the South Spur route and then skied the Southwest Chutes. And since then, I've gone back a couple of times. Um, two weeks ago, Mike and I went back with a buddy of ours and climbed the Adams Glacier, which is an ice fall on the north side, and then descended the North Ridge. And then last week, Micah and I, although not on the same day, it was like three days apart, I think, we climbed the South Spur and then uh, skied the, the South Route. And so even though we're not super experts on the mountain, I think we have enough expertise to share with you to try to keep you safe if you decide to climb it. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to share my screen here, see if this works. Awesome, cool. And so I'm gonna ask if you have questions um, to type them into the chat box. We'll be more than happy to answer anything that you have to ask. 
I'm going to try to stop every couple of slides, check the chat box, and see if I can address your questions um, as you're asking them. This is a little awkward for me. Usually I'm in a room with people that I can interact with, so we're going to do the best that we can. So again, this is Mount Adams climbing safety. So I'd like to start um, by, oh, there's the poll. Can I minimize that? Oh yeah, sorry, we're a little behind on this, guys. We meant to do this at the start of the presentation, but we do want to get a little bit of information from people just to know what your experience is, if you've climbed down before, if everyone here is the first time, um, and just a little bit of other background information. So if you take a quick second, answer the poll, we will get right back into the presentation. Do you want me to pause and let people answer? I don't or, think so. Or maybe I, just I talk think, over people like I usually do? Yeah, talk over people. You're pretty good at that. Good. Okay, I'm going to minimize this poll here. Okay, so I wanted to start um, by talking about where Mount Adams is. Um, it, uh, it's this white blob right here. This is a shot from Google Earth. It's uh, east of Mount St. Helens. It's southeast of Mount Rainier National Park. It's in the state of Washington. It's across the Columbia from us. Um, it takes a couple hours, two and a half, maybe three hours to get to the trailhead from Portland, depending on where you're driving from. And you do have to cross a toll bridge twice, so make sure you bring cash. Um, Mount Adams is actually where it's located. It's actually split. The eastern half is located in the Yakima Nation and the western half is located in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, which uh, actually a, a specific part of the Gifford Pinchot called the Mount Adams um, Wilderness. Um, the Mount Adams Recreation Area, which is this area here, the eastern slopes, is in the Yakima Nation, and so access to that part of the mountain is restricted from uh, July 1st to October 1st. You need permits from the Yakima Nation to be over there, um, and it's best to respect their wishes. The eastern half, and I'll, and I'll talk more about um, the western half here, and I'll talk more about what permits you actually need, but uh, these are public lands. You can be on these lands um, any day of the year, but you do need permits. I also wanted to take a moment um, to do a, a native uh, land acknowledgement. And so um, in 18, before, before 1854, when this area um, became the Washington Territory, thousands of years before that, the land was inhabited by native people namely for this area, the Yakima and the Cowlitz. And their uh, native name of Mount Adams was Pato or Klickitat. And so it's important to think about um, the people that have inhabited these lands um, in the distant past, as well as the way that we use them currently. Ooh, there we go. Okay, so here is um, just a couple of facts about Mount Adams. Um, its uh, peak is 12,281 feet, give or take how much snow is up there, I think, any given year. Um, depending on which source you look at, it's either the third or the fourth tallest Cascade volcano. The first being, of course, Mount Rainier, the second being Mount Shasta. And if you count Shastina, it's actually about 100 feet taller than Mount Adams. Shastina is that kind of cone that sticks out of the side of Shasta. Some people count it, some people don't. Um, anyway, Mount Adams, 12,281 feet tall. It's pretty tall. Uh, it's a thousand feet, about a thousand feet taller, a little over a thousand feet taller than Mount Hood, which is the tallest peak in Oregon. And so if you've never been that high on a mountain, it's possible that you might experience altitude sickness. And so that's one of the hazards that Micah is gonna address later on in the presentation. Uh, Mount Adams is the second largest Cascade volcano by volume. If you think about the volume, the sheer massiveness of these mountains, it's pretty big. The first largest is actually Mount Shasta, and then of course third is Mount Rainier. The first recorded climb of the south side was in 1854, and currently there are about 14,000 summit attempts per year, which is a lot. That's a lot of people to be on one mountain. There are um, over 25 routes to the summit. I believe most of these routes um, are either not repeated or not often repeated due to objective hazards. There's really only four or five relatively common routes that people climb. Over 90% of summit attempts are via the south side, and so that's what we're going to focus our presentation on, given that it's 
the most common route that people climb. Uh, just, um, I like this slide because it shows the glaciers on the mountain. So this is like an overview. The star, of course, is the summit here. Um, the south route that most people climb winds its way around glaciers and actually doesn't cross any glaciers. And so it's not technically, you don't have to cross any crevasses or anything like that. It's the most common route. The southwest chutes um, uh, kind of go this way, southwest of the mountain. And then on the eastern side, the Mazama Glacier here is a relatively common route that people climb. It is glaciated, there are crevasse crossings, and it is located completely in the Yakima Nation. And so there is restricted access and you do need uh, permits from the Yakima Nation to climb. The Adams Glacier is a relatively common glacier that um, people climb. You do need technical uh, glacier experience, uh, glacier travel experience and technical ice climbing experience to be able to climb that ice fall. And then the North Ridge is this ridge here, again, a route that people do climb um, more often in the summer when there's no snow on it. It's, there's a lot of scree and it's really loose. So I'd be really careful if I was gonna climb that route. So the most traveled routes, um, again, are probably the Mazama Glacier and the South Spur route. Um, I like this picture because it shows a three-dimensional outline of the mountain. Um, the South Spur route starts at the Cold Springs Campground, which is at the end of road, I believe it's Forest Road 8040, 4080, 8040? 8040, yeah. 8040. Um, so it's at the end of that road, and the Cold Springs Campground is here. And then this, uh, this route, it winds its way up the South Climb Trail, crosses the PCT, and then ascends up the side of the mountain to a flat area called Lunch Counter, up a big giant snow slope to a false summit, and then up to the top um, to the summit. The Mazama route, the Mazama Glacier route, ascends kind of a, a southeasterly aspect, meets up with the south route, and then they summit together. Okay, just a brief overview about what the south route is like. It is moderately strenuous. It gains about 6,800 feet over six miles up and then six miles down. So that's more than a thousand feet of elevation gain per mile, which in my mind makes it pretty steep. Um, it is a non-technical climb and that doesn't mean you don't need no skills. Wow, that came out wrong. That doesn't mean you don't, that means you still need skills. <laughs> you just don't need, uh, there's no glaciers to cross, there's no ice to climb, unless you go out of your way to find them. Um, but you still do need to know how to technically use crampons and an ice axe safely. Uh, most of it is, um, oh, the host is sharing poll results. Do you wanna share these now or? Uh, well, yeah, we can come back to them. Maybe we'll come back to them at the end. Yeah, we can come back to it. Um, most of the route is 20 to 35 degree slopes. Um, most of it is, is under 35, I would say. Um, it's going to be either steep snow and or scree, depending on what time of year you climb. Um, even though it's considered a non-technical climb, there, uh, it does require advanced backcountry skills. And these include avalanche safety. Even though the route's not super steep, there are areas on the route that can slide. Um, and you also need to know which areas to avoid. There are cornices and other avalanche hazards. Um, you do need to know how to travel on snow. You do need to know how to manage cold weather. It gets very cold at the top, even in the summer. Um, I've never been on the top of the mountain where I haven't been cold, even South Sister in August, it's cold up there. So you do need to know how to manage cold weather. Um, you do need to know how to read weather forecasts so you don't end up there in a whiteout. And navigation is also very, very important. And Mike is going to talk actually quite a bit about navigation because I think this is going to be, for this route, the most important way to stay out of trouble is to be able to navigate well. You can climb this route um, in one full day or over two days. And I would say people, people do both. Um, what gear do I need to climb? So I'm going to talk about the winter spring first and then I'll go back to the summer fall. 
In the winter, spring, you definitely need to carry your 10 essentials. If you don't know what that is, there's, Mike and I can point you towards some resources. REI's got a great page on the 10 essentials. You definitely need to bring water with you. Plenty of calories. You burn a lot of calories walking up 6,800 feet. Um, insulation layers, for sure. It can get very, very cold in the winter um, and even in the spring. You do most definitely need ice axe, real crampons, not micro spikes, and skis for the descent if that's the way you choose to travel. You do need permits, and I'll talk about permitting um, in a bit. Uh, Backcountry snow training, for sure, and navigation skills. Now in the summer, fall, I understand I haven't been up there late in the summer. Um, because I like to ski, so I, I don't really know for sure, but I understand that the route can be completed completely snow-free in late August or September. Um, and even so, I would bring some type of micro spikes with me just in case you do have to walk on snow or for some reason the snow hardens, like the sun doesn't come out. Um, but even in the summer, fall, you need to bring 10 essentials, water, plenty of calories, insulation layers, sturdy boots, permits, um, and backcountry knowledge, as well as navigation skills. Are there any questions, Micah, that we can answer? Uh, yeah, we just got one in the chat and we're wondering if we're in winter spring conditions or summer fall conditions. And we're kind of in between right now. The route itself is starting to get pretty consolidated, uh, pretty well melted out. So you're gonna be traveling on, on dirt and rock at this point for the first about two miles. Um, and after that, the snow is pretty stable. So we do still recommend bringing ice axe and crampons, but it's not quite like winter conditions. Um, so we're kind of in between. I would also say like, I think summer fall is a little bit of a misnomer. Instead of summer fall, I think it should say um, August, September. <laughs> yeah. Because, because it, I mean, there's snow on the route basically up until August, and then it starts snowing again, like in late September, October. So maybe we should rename this August, September. <laughs> that was a good question. Um, so a few other questions just came up on gear two. Sure. Uh, one, is there water on the route? There's going to be a few spots where you can get uh, water. I don't think there's any actual stream crossings, but you could find a few spots of snow melt. Once you're up at lunch counter, I would hesitate to drink the water up there because it's a very highly populated camping area. Um, so plan on melting snow for the most part. Um, also, is a helmet needed? Yes, absolutely. Um, anytime you're traveling on steep snow or ice, a helmet is highly recommended um, in case of fall, in case of something comes bouncing down from above. Um, so yeah, and we had one question on the North Ridge. Uh, if we could, we're gonna keep this kind of focused on the South route, um, the Southwest shoots right now, but towards the end of the presentation, when we have more time for questions, if you have questions on any of the other other routes, we can take them then. Now I don't know if we can actually answer any questions about the North Bridge because we kind of bailed off of it halfway down, but we'll we'll try. We'll try. Okay, so climbing permits, and so this this bit of information is different. Uh, this year they changed the permitting system. This year, um, yes, you do need a climbing permit. It's required above, a Cascade Volcano Pass is what's required above 7,000 feet. Um, all year, the permits are free self-issue wilderness permits at the trailhead, but May 1st through September 30th, you need a Cascade Volcano Pass. These used to be available um, at the Trout Creek Ranger Station. They're now online at recreation.gov, and my understanding is you cannot buy them at the Trout Creek Ranger Station anymore. Um, I was at the trailhead last week, um, the South Climb Trailhead last week, and there is like a little QRL code on the kiosk. And so I think if you scan that, you might be able to buy one at the trailhead with your phone. Um, I don't get great service there, so that would be kind of useless for me. Um, I have Verizon. I know T-Mobile doesn't get service there. Verizon gets kind of spotty service. But if you forget- at and get service up there. at and gets service up there. But if you, get, if you forget your permit, it's worth a shot. See if you can buy one. Um, on a weekday, Monday through Thursday, they're 10 bucks. Um, Friday through Sunday, they're $15. Uh, 
If you're staying below 7,000 feet, you do need a Northwest Forest Pass to park um, anywhere in the wilderness area. If you buy a Cascade Volcano Pass, you don't need a Northwest Forest Pass because that Volcano Pass acts as your Northwest Forest Pass. However, you do need to print it out and put it on your dash so the rangers can see. And that area is pretty highly patrolled by rangers. Um, I've been stopped by rangers twice and asked for my permit. And so you can count on being stopped and asked for a permit. Uh, just a few, um, are there any questions about, about that, Micah, or can I? Uh, yeah, just a couple of questions on the amount of people allowed per permit. So each individual climber will need uh, his or her own permit for a car, the permits are by car. So for the forest pass, you just need to have one for each vehicle. Um, that we know of, there isn't a limit of how many people can be on the mountain at once. I don't know if there's something implemented in the permit issuing system. There wasn't in the past, um, and we haven't heard of anything now, but you could check with the ranger station and know for sure. Cool. We did want to say a few words about Leave No Trace. This is a very highly trafficked area. Um, there's a lot of people on the mountain on the weekends. It looks like a shopping mall or a cattle train, um, which is fine, but you just need to be aware and respectful of other people. There are seven principles of Leave No Trace that we always try to follow. Plan ahead and prepare. This will help you not be part of a search and rescue operation. Um, travel and camp on durable surfaces up on lunch counter, which is a flat area that's about 95, 9,000 and 9,500 feet up on the mountain. There are exposed rock surfaces um, where you can pitch a tent. Uh, and there's actually a lot of rock wind shelters that have been built up there. You can also camp on snow if you want to, it's colder. Dispose of waste properly. So basically this means on a mountain, you're gonna pack out everything that you pack in, don't leave anything on the mountain. Um, I'm going to talk about human waste in the next slide and blue bags. Leave what you find. This includes flowers, rocks, any, any kind of thing like that. Unless it's trash, then you can take it. Minimize campfire impacts. Actually, no fires are allowed at the trailhead or on this route. Um, respect wildlife. So when I was uh, camped out there last week and I uh, skied the South Spur, a buddy of mine um, got out of his tent in the middle of the night to throw something away and there was a cougar next to the um, the garbage cans. So just be aware that there are there is wildlife there. Um, some of it can be potentially dangerous. Also, the chipmunks are crazy. They will burrow into your pack to eat whatever they want. Um, and the deer are very tame there. So just make sure to not feed the wildlife, unless of course they steal it from you and then you can't do anything about that. Um, and also be considerate of other visitors. Um, please don't fly drones there. Um, they're very distracting to people. And also, please don't play music. Earbuds are totally fine, but, but don't play music. Not everyone on the mountain likes the same music that you do. And people go out to have um, you know, nice experiences in nature. So just be considerate. I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about everyone's favorite subject, which is the blue bag, the wag bag, um, whatever you want to call it. So these, in case you're not familiar with these, these are used in the backcountry to pack out all human waste. Um, good aim is required. These at Mount Adams I find particularly funny because they have old targets on them. So you gotta make sure to poop on the target right here. Um, you can find stacks of these at the Climbers Cave on Mount Hood. They have them at the Click on Mount Rainier. They have them at the Ranger Station at Mount Shasta. Um, and so these particular ones are the only ones I know with targets on them. And I believe they still have these um, at the Ranger Station in Trout Creek. You of course are always welcome to bring your own blue bag. But the idea is you poop on the target, you wrap it up, you put it in the blue bag, you put the blue bag in the clear bag, you seal it up, you put it in your pack, you take it down to the trailhead, and then at the Cold Springs campground, there are big blue barrels where you can deposit the human waste. And that way it keeps everything clean. Um, and so people then will be less afraid to melt snow to drink it, because they know that there's not poop in the snow. Um, any questions, Micah, about that? No, we're doing great. Okay, awesome. So I like this picture. It shows the uh, skyline here. This is the south skyline. This is actually the, the Adams Glacier here, and this is the North Ridge. You can see it's a lot of exposed rock. Um, and these actually are the Southwest Chutes right here, which are pretty fun to ski. 
I like this slide because it has a couple of landmarks that are labeled. Um, you start at the Cold Springs camp. Your first kind of obstacle that you're gonna uh, encounter if you take the summer route is gonna be the Crescent Glacier Snowball. And then you can see there's kind of a long, uh, pretty mellow slope to get to lunch counter, which is a relatively flattish area before you encounter this really long 2000 foot snow slope that leads you up to the false summit. And believe me, it's very, very false because then there's about a half a mile flat area you walk across before you get to the final pitch up to the true summit, which is about 800 feet. Um, so the route starts at the south, uh, at the Cold Springs campground, and it's pictured here. It is a campground. There aren't very many um, developed sites. There are a few sites with picnic tables, but it's generally pretty crowded. It's been pretty crowded most of the times that I've been up there. So most of the time people just pull off, find a flat place, sleep in their car to start their climb early the next morning, pitch a tent. Um, there are a couple of um, vault toilets, vault composting toilets up there. There's trash cans, um, there's blue bag barrels, and apparently there's cougars up there now too. So just be aware. Um, so this uh, campground, the Cold Springs campground, there isn't any water there. Uh -huh. it says Cold Springs, but there's no water there. So you do need to bring uh, all the water that you're going to need or plan to melt snow. This, um, this campground is at the end of Forest Road, what do we say, 4080? Is that what it was? 8040. 8040. <laughs> can't, I can't ever remember. Um, the road's not plowed. And so if you want to, if you want to start at the campground, you have to wait until the road and the campground have melted out. And that's most of the time, like mid to late May, early June. And you can easily find trip reports on Facebook to figure out. And you can, you can also go to the, um, the Gifford Pinchot National Forest webpage and they'll give you updated road conditions. The road itself is a journey, six miles of unpaved, uh, pretty bumpy, non-maintained forest road, some washboards, um, I've been up there in a Camry, makes it just fine. Mike has taken his legacy up there, but most people prefer something that's a little higher clearance to keep the, the scrapies off the bottom. Couple questions about road conditions. So the road is clear of snow um, all the way to the trailhead. It usually melts out um, late May, early June. You can get up there in passenger cars most of the time. Um, the road is pretty rough. It's not maintained. There's washboards, there's potholes, there's very big potholes, there's drainage cutoffs, um, but it can be done. A high clearance SUV is definitely recommended. Is that the only question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like a, a rite of passage driving up that road. Uh, the route, again, is 12 miles round trip, 6,800 feet of elevation. So it's it's pretty long and steep. The route winds through the forests into lava flow gullies and eventually to snow fields. I don't know if you can tell from this picture, but there was a burn, a pretty extensive burn up there in 2012. And so a lot of the trees are burned. Um, so you'll see a lot of that when you go up there. Uh, there's also on this route, this what we call the south route or the south spur route. There's two variations. There's the summer route versus the winter route. And I'm gonna talk about the differences in those routes in the next slide. And again, the snow fields up to the summit, 35 degrees, mostly less. And then don't be fooled by the fall summit. I was like, my heart just sank the first time I got up there and I was like, oh, <laughs> there's a long way to go. Okay, so this is a picture of um, the summer route versus the winter route. So the Cold Springs campground would be kind of here down at the bottom. And both trails um, uh, start, both uh, routes start at the campground and they start on the, um, uh, what's it called? The South Climb Trail. The South Climb Trail then crosses the PCT, which is a, a good marker because there's a big sign that says PCT. Um, and then they split. The summer route goes to the left, the winter route goes to the right. I actually like the winter route better. It's um, the angle is less. I, I feel like it just takes me less time to go up that way to reach lunch counter because it's a lot less steep. The problem is it does melt out um, faster than the summer route. And so uh, it, you get these rock bands that if you're skiing, you have to take your skis off and walk across and it's kind of a pain. So this time of year, I believe most everyone 
is taking the summer route. When I climbed it uh, last week, I had to take the summer route. And it does avoid the loose rock and the exposed rock bands, but it does have cornices. Um, when you approach the Crescent Glacier here, this kind of edge of the, this cliff here, probably some type of um, lateral moraine, there are cornices along this area and you gotta be careful to avoid them. There's also, as you cross here, there's uh, deep moats. Moats are where the snow melts out uh, and makes deep holes and I almost fell into one a couple years ago and it, it's no good. So just be aware of those dangers. Um, also, I did see some activity of wet slides in here last week, um, but you can avoid those if you just go kind of around the edge. Uh, and then this makes its way up to lunch counter where it meets up with the winter route and then they both ascend the snow slope up to Piker's Peak, which is the name of the false summit. Um, and then up to the true summit, which is where this little asterisk is. Okay, so just a few notes about the climb. People do it in one day, people do it in two days, some people spend a week up there, it's a beautiful place, so why not? Um, the past couple of times uh, when I skied the Southwest Chutes and then last week when I went up and skied the South Face, um, I did it one day. This uh, bullet point says expect 10 to 12 hours round trip. I think, um, Micah, when you skied it, you were up in like four hours and down in an hour or something. Yeah, uh, it was about six and a half round trip. Yeah, he's, um, he's real fast though. So for us mortals, I would say, I would expect more like six to eight hours. And then I think 10 to 12 hours would be more if you're walking up and down the mountain. If you're skiing, you're gonna get down a lot faster. Um, it's advised to leave before sunlight because of course it's easier to go up when the snow is firm. If you're doing it in one day versus two, your pack's gonna be a lot lighter. Um, but of course, make sure to bring your 10 essentials and your helmet and a headlamp um, and then extra food for a long day. And then real quick, if you are hoping to do a ski descent, definitely leave a little bit later in the day. Um, you know, when you're looking at a ski descent, you want to give the, the snow time to soften up. People are usually looking for a ski descent between 10 and 11 a.m., somewhere in there, um, depending, you know, on, on the weather and the wind conditions, but just to kind of give you a reference point. Yeah, if you're walking, it's better to start earlier because it's going to take a little bit longer, and on the way down, you're not going to want to be post-holing. So for a two-day climb, you're going to need to pack overnight gear, and if you want to take a lightweight summit pack, you can do that. Timing-wise, um, from your car at the South Climb Trailhead to lunch counter is gonna be three to four hours-ish. From lunch counter to the summit, another three or four hours. And then from the summit back to camp, pick up, clean up your camp, and then back to the car is gonna be about six or seven hours. If you do choose to climb this way, I would advise to leave lunch counter around sunrise to maximize firm footing on the ascent. And also make sure to mark where your camp is and you'll realize this when you get about halfway up that big snow slope, when you look around, it's like it all looks the same. So either drop a breadcrumb or a waypoint or, um, I don't know, bring a flag, something to mark where your camp is. So here are um, some pictures of the route. So this is a picture of me and um, my buddy Isaac. We skied it last week. This is a picture of the South Climb Trail. You can see it's wide, it's pretty dusty. I mean, there is a little bit of water here, but I definitely wouldn't drink that. It's probably dirty. Um, this, was, <laughs> this was on the way down, obviously, because it was, it was bright light. But this is, um, this is what it looks like. You can see the burn here. Um, and then the mountain is actually behind us because we're leaving. This is a picture of um, the Crescent Glacier Snow Bowl. So this was probably the, I think the steepest part of the whole route when we climbed it last week. Um, you can see that uh, this is, well, you can see all the ski tracks here, first of all, but you can kind of see it, it's actually pretty steep. There was some wet slide activity up here. There were some cornices behind us, and then there's actually some cracks here that are starting to form and uh, quite a few moats. Um, but I just wanted to, to show you this to, show you the perspective of um, how steep it is. And then you can see my impeccable skinning technique. I call this the face plant. My buddy uh, Isaac likes to take pictures of me when I fall down, because when people fall down, it's pretty fun. 
This is, um, I don't know who these people are, but this is a nice picture showing the gentle snow slopes that lead up to the steeper snow slope. So this is lunch counter here, and this is that really steep snow slope that leads up to the uh, fall summit. This is a picture of that 2000 foot snow slope all the way up. Um, this is a beautiful thing to ski if you're so inclined. Usually there is an incredible boot pack up this whole thing. And so you don't need to kick steps or anything. And then generally off to climbers left, there's going to be a couple of like glissade shoots from heaven. So people do glissade like all 2000 feet of this, um, which is pretty fun if you're into that kind of thing. There's also usually a good skin track up here if you're interested in skinning up. And then the last little bit here um, is the summit push from Piker's Peak. And it's um, generally a little bit steeper, I think, than the snow slope, but not, not too bad. There's also glissade chutes here on this, uh, the last little summit push. And this is about 800 feet from Piker's Peak, 800 vertical feet from Piker's Peak. And then there's the summit. Um, apparently there's a cabin up there. I've never seen said cabin. Uh, but it was um, built in like the 1910s as a fire lookout and then that was abandoned and then it was used as a sulfur mining cabin. Um, it's apparently a pretty extensive structure. There's two stories. This is actually the second story of it. Again, I've never seen it. I think the, when I stand on the summit, I think it's the, the ice chunks that are on top of this cabin. But Micah, you said last time you were up there, you were seeing bits of it start to peek through. Yeah, it's, it's starting to melt out now. So if you want to go up there and look at it, you can. I'm just never up there late enough to see it. But yeah, pretty cool. 12,281 feet on the summit. Um, the, and there's the down. And so there's a number of ways you can get down a mountain. Um, generally, I recommend either walking, skiing, or glissading. Uh, the glissading is uh, preferred to walking, mainly because it's faster, but it is more dangerous. And so we all know that going down the mountain is often more dangerous than going up the mountain for a number of reasons. So what I'm gonna do now, are there any questions, Micah, that I can answer before I turn this presentation over to you? No, I think we'll just keep moving. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn this presentation over to Micah. Do you want me to keep sharing my screen and then I can just forward your slides? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, let's do that. Okay. So, what people tend to overlook is the hazards don't end when you start your descent. Um, this is usually when people get into trouble for a multitude of reasons. Uh, primarily, they're tired. People don't look at things as clearly when, you know, they've been moving for 10 hours straight and it's hot and they haven't drank enough water or eating enough food. Um, and they tend to overlook things that they wouldn't overlook. Also, descending a steep snow field is not a uh, given. There's a lot of ways that you can injure yourself, and it's very easy to get lost as you start to return to the tree line, especially coming down Mount Adams, and if any of you are familiar with the descent off of Mount St. Helens, um, it all looks the same. It's very, very hard to find the exact spot that you came out of. Um, so we're going to tackle a couple of these things, and we're going to talk about the human factors, but the first thing that we'll cover is glissading, and we want to go over a proper glissading technique. Mm -hmm. yeah. Waiting for... oh, there it is. yeah, so <laughs> I can't get over this guy. He is having a great time. Um, glissading is this fun. It, it is that fun, actually. It's, it's pretty sweet, and especially on Mount Adams. Adams is known for having glissade tubes because so many people do it. Um, that you wind up with this giant U-shaped funnel that, you know, everyone takes the same route down. And so they tend to get pretty slick and pretty fast. But if you're prepared for it, it's a great time. Was there some text to accompany this? Did you have to hit it again? Uh, to um, the chat? On the slide. No, no, on the slide itself. Oh, on the slide. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah, just go ahead and click all the text. Here. Yeah, there we go. Um, so the biggest thing to remember when we're glissading is to remove your crampons or my, you know, micro spikes if you had them on the way up. Um, crampons work really well at getting traction in snow, but when you're sliding downhill and your crampons catch, that's a great way to break your ankle or your tibia or anything else in your leg. Um, so take your crampons off. 
If you're not familiar with self-arrest and using your ice axe, it's a great thing to practice before you start your climb up on Mount Adams. There's a lot of pretty low consequence uh, snow slopes that you can try and slide down and use your axe to stop yourself. Um, and if you're taking a two day trip, you're gonna have a lot of time at lunch counter um, to, to practice this stuff. So I highly recommend using that time and that space to get familiar with it. Uh, also, and something that people tend to overlook is glissading tends to separate everything from the outside of your pack that's not securely strapped down. Um, it's very common to be walking down alongside a glissade path and to find ice axes and food and water bottles. And I found a tent one time coming down right here. Um, someone was pretty disappointed to have lost that. So before you go, make absolutely sure that everything is either in your pack or tightly strapped down. Um, and don't be afraid to check, stop and check every now and then too. Um, so uh, the conditions, you know, if you're starting your descent earlier in the day, like we talked about with skiing, it's going to be very slick, so it's going to be faster. If you're starting later in the day, snow gets softer and slushy, um, it's going to be a little bit more forgiving, it's going to be softer on the bum. So if you can, recommend starting your descent later in the day, uh, as long as it's not too late, you know, we're talking 10, 12 o'clock maybe is when things start to get good. Um, snow, snow type, again, now that we're coming into the spring and summer, it's gonna be pretty uniform snow conditions. Um, we're not really expecting any new snow. We're not gonna be seeing any big patches of ice. Um, so it's gonna be harder and firmer in the morning and then it's gonna be softer later in the afternoon. Uh, the run out, again, so Mount Adams, the Glissade Pass, they kind of only take you one way because they tend to get pretty big. Um, what you do need to watch out for, especially lower down on the route, you know, because sometimes there's some glissade tracks below lunch counter, is watch out for rocks. Uh, rocks will start to work their way through in the glissade path and they will really mess up your tailbone if you hit one of those. Um, also gloves, if you have gloves, leave them on for your, your descent. Um, you don't want to be trying to stop yourself with your hands and end up burning all the skin off your palms. Next. I also find that um, it also rips your pants up. And the older I get, the more expensive my pants get. So I tend not to glissade unless I have some type of thing to sit on. Go. And so I just saw a question about PPE in the chat. Um, again, you know, we see what these folks are wearing here. You've got a helmet, you've got gloves, you've got your, your thick soled mountain boots. Um, full pants if you have them, gaiters are great to keep the snow out of your boots, uh, and your ice axe. Um, yeah, there should be some text on this slide too. Yeah, so again, we want to emphasize crampons off, put them in your pack, don't put them on your feet. Um, sit down with your feet spread apart, downhill, you can usually put your feet outside like the glissade tube before you get started and then once you're ready to go, you can kind of tuck everything in to get some speed. Um, ice axe with the point down in the snow. Again, if you haven't practiced your self-arrest technique, this is the time to learn it um, before you do it. If you do start to get out of control, that's when you want to try and roll yourself out, get on top of that ice axe, um, get your knees down into the snow and try and, and you know, arrest your fall and bring yourself to a stop. Um, some people have used, I've seen bring trash bags up and so what they'll get like a thick black uh, contractor grade trash bag and put it underneath them and sit on that to slide down. That's one option. I know they also make uh, uh, glissading sleds. The mountain shop has some so if you want to really have a fun time you can go over there and pick up one of these things and I think it's basically like a kind of a shovel blade looking thing that you can sit on um, and slide down so all of those are great. Um, but other than that, just sitting on your pants, I mean, it works fine. You know, soft shell pants will definitely slow you down. Hard shell pants will go pretty fast. Um, but yeah, if they're super expensive, maybe it's not the, yeah, the best thing to do. Walking down is always an option. You can always just walk down. You don't have to glissade. Um, plenty of people do that too. And, and you can always ski down too. So don't feel like you have to glissade. It's just faster and it's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, so... Navigation. This is probably the most common thing where people get themselves into trouble that requires rescue. Um, yeah, go ahead and, and bring up the text on this one too. Uh, 
because we thought they were being clever. Yeah, got to change that. So as you're coming down, um, this time of year, the route is going to be pretty obvious. There's a lot of people up there, which means there's a lot of boot tracks to follow. Um, as long as you don't get stuck in a whiteout, and this is where being aware of your surroundings starts to come into place. Um, check the weather forecast before you go. Check the, the conditions as best you can. If you can talk to someone who's been up recently, there's a number of Facebook groups dedicated to climbing in the Northwest where people are always posting reports. You can ask if anyone's been up recently if you can't find what you're looking for. Um, so use all these things to your advantage. Um, as you're coming down into tree line, this is where it's can get really difficult to find exactly where you went. When I came down the other week, I had stashed my shoes um, at a tree and I was, you know, there's no way if I wouldn't, have, I would have been able to find that tree, you know, even knowing and, and paying attention to exactly where it was if I didn't set a GPS uh, marker for it. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, not finding your camp at lunch counter. As you're coming down, uh, lunch counter, it, it's not a small area. I mean, this is a place that's the size of, you know, four to six football fields. I mean, it's a pretty big area. Um, and it all kind of looks the same once you get down in it. There's lots of little ridges, lots of little piles of rocks. So don't just think, oh, well, I set my tent next to that pile of rocks. There's, there's a lot of rocks um, and you can't really see them all. So, you know, pay attention to this stuff because even if you have to, you know, hunt around for your tent for an hour, um, when you're tired, when it's been a long day, that can make a big difference and you still have a long ways to go. Um, also, and if we go to the next slide, we're going to talk about um, coming down off the summit and making sure, oh, it wasn't that slide. Um, oh, we'll get it on the, we'll get it on the next one. Um, so we'll go into navigation now and bring up the text here too. So this day and age, the best thing to have with you um, aside from a dedicated GPS device is your phone. Your phone is a very capable GPS device. You, know, you don't have to go out and buy one uh, specifically for us. You can, they're great, um, but our phones are very, very capable. There's a couple apps that work really well for this. Uh, Avenza is one that gets used a lot. Gaia is another one. Uh, Caltopo is also starting to use their own app. And I, even Google Maps can work. Um, but there's, at this point, there's really no excuse not to have a navigation app on your phone and knowing how to use it. So don't let the first time you ever use this be once you're out climbing. Um, there's a lot of resources online and, and it's pretty easy to find this stuff if you search around or, or ask some people for help uh, to find a GPS, uh, GPS track from someone else who's climbed the route or to look on a map and, and to put one on your phone. Uh, so download the app play with it beforehand and, and know how to use it. So as you're going, uh, it's great to check in occasionally and make sure you're still on route. You know, don't wait until you get lost um, before you look at the map for the first time. Go ahead and check back on it periodically. Um, when you do have a place of interest, so if you decide that you're gonna stash some gear on the way up or to grab when you come down or where you set your, your tent at lunch counter or anything else, set a GPS point there. That way you'll always be able to look on the map and know exactly where that was. And all of these maps, apps will let you navigate back to those points. Um, also, don't be unfamiliar with the basics. A map and compass still bring one of those with it. It's, you know, your phone can lose battery. Um, they don't work as well when they're cold. So, it, you know, there's no reason not to have a map and compass and also to know how to use that because that's gonna be a backup you can always rely on. Luckily, again, with Mount Adams, there's a lot of boot tracks. Uh, if you get lost, or if you think you're starting to get lost, find a boot track, because at this point, they're almost all going to be going back to the same spot. Um, yeah, so if we go to the next slide here. So Micah, there's a question here. What's a good paper map for this route? You know, if you went into the mountain shop, they would love to tell you that. Um, there's a number of paper maps and they're all gonna work just fine. Some have a little bit more detail than others, um, but they have a, a couple good green trails maps or other ones that are gonna have um, the route on it. And you can also, you know, write in your own route. Um, and I'm sure they'll, they'll be happy to help you as well because everyone there is, is super familiar with this or would be able to point you to someone who is. Cool, next slide. 
Yeah. So um, we mentioned earlier about getting lost on the descent off of the summit. So this picture was taken from the summit. It's looking down to that little blob you see in front there is, uh, is the top of Piker's Peak or the false summit. Um, so as you're descending, if you were to go and we want to click, let's bring the text up again here. Yeah. Um, so the at this point in time, you're going to see a giant boot track. There's a there's a hundred tracks that follow that green line and head out in that direction. And and at this time of year, you're probably also going to see people um, that are standing towards that top corner where the green line goes out of sight. If you wanted to send the south route, all you need to do is make sure that you stay to the left of that point. Uh, if you're looking for a ski descent and you want to ski the southwest chutes, then you're going to want to veer to the right at that point. Now we haven't talked a whole lot about the southwest chutes and so we'll go to it real briefly. Um, this is primarily a route that gets skied. It's not one that gets climbed or descended on foot very often. Just because it doesn't offer a whole lot um, for someone who's who's climbing by foot that the southwest or the south route doesn't. Um, but it is a little bit complicated to get back to the trailhead from the southwest chutes. It's not quite as straightforward. You have to do a little bit of a cross-country traverse. So if you do descend to go down the southwest chutes, make very, very sure that you know where you're going, that you have a map because it's quite easy to uh, to get sucked off track there. And you will have to go back uphill at one point. You have to descend down to a certain point. Um, you can't just keep going. You'll eventually have to, to walk back up to rejoin the trail. And then you're back on the normal south side route. Um, so just something to keep in mind. And again, um, I saw another question come up in the chat, the difference between the red and the green. Um, so again, if you're on the standard route, the south side route, you want to follow the green line as you're descending. You want to stay at the left side of that point. This is where you're going to see most people going. Um, it's also where you would have came up. So again, if you're setting a track on your GPS like you should be, um, you can just follow this back. But if you are interested in looking for the Southwest Chutes route, which is a different route, um, then you would take that red line and you would go to the right at that point. All right, next slide. So I've had a, a couple questions come up, um, just a little bit of a backup. One question is um, what time to start a two-day climb and what time to start for the summit on the second day. Uh, so I would start the two-day climb, it's going to take three or four hours for your car up to lunch counter, so probably around noon, maybe earlier in the morning. And then I would start, uh, depending on the time of year, around 4 or 5 a.m. to start for the summit on the second day. The second question is, what do I sit on while glissading? Oh, there are a number of things you can sit on while you're glissading. I've tried them all. <laughs> Not many of them really work. Um, I've tried sitting on part of a closed cell phone, like a, a ridge rest, that doesn't stay put. I've tried um, wearing a garbage can, kind of like a diaper, and that just gets uh, snow in the diaper. Um, you can try wrapping yourself in a garbage bag. I don't know, Mike, do you have any solutions for what to sit on when glissading? Uh, we, well, we talked about that briefly before. So yeah, um, trash bags, scoot sled, or your pants. Um, I think scoot sled would be the way to go, especially if you want to go down the mountain like warp speed. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other, another question is for a one-day climb in July, what time would you suggest starting? If you're skiing, I would suggest probably three or four in the morning. If you're walking, probably a little bit earlier. Yeah. All right, next slide. Yeah, um, so human factors. This is kind of the big, the big variation. It's not something um, that we can really account for in any kind of systematic way. So it's just something we have to talk ourselves through um, because everyone's different. So we saw from the poll that most people, I think it was about 70%, um, this is your first time climbing Mount Adams, and I couldn't really tell if there was a lot of experience climbing other mountains. Um, it's always going to take longer uh, as your first time, as you're getting used to the terrain, as you're getting used to the techniques. So allow more time than you think, um, especially, you know, we mentioned this climb is almost 7,000 feet elevation. It's over 1,000 feet a mile. Um, so it, 
it is very arduous it's a big mountain so don't underestimate how long it's going to take again 10 to 12 hours for your first time that's pretty good if you're walking down uh, lack of awareness so again things can change very quick in these mountains um, weather can come in unexpectedly and even if it's not bad weather you know we're probably not going to be seeing too many more blizzards in this point in time um, but you could very easily get into the clouds. There could be a lenticular that just buries the summit. Um, at that point, you lose all depth perception. You, it's hard to explain um, how hard it is to see where you're going. So this is where GPS uh, map and compass becomes invaluable. But usually there's warning signs that you can see this stuff coming. So you can see clouds off in the distance. You can see the wind starting to pick up. Um, you can feel the temperature dropping, things like that. Those are all things to be aware of. Uh, fitness. So again, along with fitness comes your hydration and comes your calorie intake. Make sure you're eating, make sure you're drinking. It gets really hot up there. I mean, you, you might be up at, at 10,000 or 12,000 feet, but sometimes if there's no wind and you're in the sun and you've got a heavy pack in your bag, you're sweating. It's really hot. So drink a lot of water. Uh, you know, I usually take at least two liters up on something like this where it's long and it's hot um, and a lot of calories too. So make sure you're eating, you're eating regularly. Don't wait until you're starving to eat, you know, little bits along the way so you avoid the dreaded bonk um, and you can keep a nice, slow, steady pace. Uh, and the slow, steady pace really comes into play um, keeping in mind that we're at a high altitude here. Most of the steep climbing is going to be above 10,000 feet. And so it, it's really important to pace yourself. Um, pace yourself, try not to get exhausted. You know, a lot of people will do the, the sprint and then they sit there and try and catch their breath for five, 10 minutes. That's gonna wear you out really quickly. Uh, a slow trotting pace, even if you think you know, oh, is this going way too slow? Well, you're gonna be doing that for the next four hours. Um, so get comfortable. And uh, again, a great way to fight off altitude sickness is to drink water. If you're starting to feel lightheaded and if you feel a headache coming on, drink more water. Um, be communicating with the members of your group. So um, talk about how everyone's feeling, ask people how they're feeling and trying to, you know, no one needs to be a hero here. If you're feeling sore, if you're feeling tired, um, it's okay to talk about that. It's encouraged to talk about that. You know, let the people that you know, uh, let the people with, that you're with know what's going on. Um, these are all great things to keep in mind. Um, no one wants to have to get rescued. If you do find yourself in a situation where you need some kind of intervention, there's a lot of things that we want you to keep in mind. Um, so go ahead on the next slide. When shit hits the fan. Um, this is kind of a, a mock scenario that we're going to use just to illustrate some of the points. Um, so you and three friends, you had a great day climbing Mount Adams. Um, something was glorious and the ski down sublime. You failed to monitor your route, something we just talked about, navigation, and now you're way rest of the route headed back to the Cold Springs Trailhead. You had to travel cross country below tree line through a melting spring snowpack and Debbie, and it's always Debbie, punched through the snow around a log and exploded her tibia. Uh, you witnessed a beautiful but unwelcome sunset. Debbie won't stop screaming. So it's dark um, and it, it will get dark quickly out there. So go ahead on to the next slide. So there's a lot of things we want to think about here. Um, the first thing is someone needs to, to take some kind of leadership role. Um, there needs to be everyone working in the same direction and hopefully there's someone there who can help facilitate that. Even in a small group, you have to have your leader. Um, the leader wants to, you know, obviously we're probably climbing in maybe three people groups or four people groups. Um, so you, everyone's doing a little bit of everything. Um, but you can still assign jobs, assign tasks. Okay, I want you to look over Debbie, make sure she's comfortable, make sure she has what she needs. Uh, I want you to see if we can find a, a better shelter or a place to get comfortable because rescues take a very long time. Um, help is, is not just down the road here at all. Next slide.
So scene assessment. Um, this is something we talk about a lot in our rescue group, and but it's something that applies just as well to recreational groups. Uh, if Debbie fell in a place at the bottom of a big snow slope where things could fall down from above her, or she fell down in a place that was near a creek that's very treacherous to, to walk around, um, you have to get somewhere safe. So yeah, it might hurt, yeah, your leg's broken, but we really shouldn't be here. Um, so we need to get you somewhere safer. So these are all things, just take a minute before you do anything, look around, is it safe to stay where we are? And is it gonna to continue to be safe where we are? Maybe it's nine o'clock in the morning and there's no problems, but if we're still here at four o'clock in the afternoon when the sun has been beating down for the last six hours, things are gonna to start to change. Uh, so keep that in mind. Safety, take a breath. Uh, no one can panic because someone who's panicking isn't a help to anyone. So slow things down, look at your priorities, uh, look at the situation and start to prioritize your tasks. Patient assessment and care is gonna be the first thing. Hopefully you know your group, you know if anyone in your group has advanced medical training. If so, uh, they're hopefully gonna be the one that's taking care of the patient. Um, they can advise other people on what they do or what they might need. One of the biggest things you can do in a recreational group is to keep the person warm. Uh, that's our biggest challenge as a mountain rescue team is keeping the patients warm. And we'll usually bring lots of extra layers, sleeping beds, foam pads, just to try and keep the patients warm because they're not gonna be moving, they're gonna be there for a long time, and it's usually dark by the time anything happens. Um, so it's best to not wait until they're cold to start to do this. If someone gets hurt and you think they're gonna be there for a while, go ahead and start putting extra layers on them. Jackets, shells, whatever you can do. Um, that's gonna help and it, it's gonna come into play later on. Um, and make a plan, a plan for the problems you're gonna have. So how are you gonna care for the patient? Um, how are you gonna get out? Can you get out on your own or do you need to call for rescue? So, how do we know if we need a rescue? I'm gonna step forward. And guys, we see your questions. Um, we're gonna get through this scenario real quick and then we're gonna hit them all at the end. Uh, so is it an emergency? Uh, life or limb, is someone gonna die or is someone going to lose a limb in this situation? If the answer is no, if it's something where you know, the sun's going to come out in the morning and you're going to be able to find your way home, then that's great. Um, if it's something where you're not sure, then yeah, it's, it's probably best to seek emergency assistance immediately. Uh, and again, keep in mind, think about what's going to happen six hours from now. If you're thinking, well, I'm not in emergency quite yet, but if you would ask that same question and say, is this gonna be an emergency in six hours if something doesn't drastically improve our situation, then go ahead and make that call um, because we would much rather you know, get spooled up and start to prepare for a mission and then get the call. And this happens all the time and get the call and say, oh, it's all right, the patient got themselves out um, or you're not needed rather than the alternative. Um, so don't, don't feel like you have to wait until the last minute to call for help. If you do have to call for help, there's a couple ways to do that. Let's go ahead and just it's jump right to fire. We did not put this slide together. We're working with what we got here. Um, emergency signaling. So cell phones actually work pretty good on the south side of Mount Adams. You have service on most of the route. So if someone, <coughs> you know, was to fall on route somewhere, there's a good chance that you or someone near you um, will be able to get out a phone call. Who do you call? 911. It's always 911. You're not calling a search and rescue organization directly. Um, just call 911 and they will direct you to the people you need to talk to. Um, personal locator beacons, also known as PLBs. These are something that I think have fallen out of favor a little bit, but they still work great. And all it is, it's the button you press and that button um, lights up a switchboard at an emergency management station somewhere and they figure someone needs help. The problem is there's no communication. You can't say that, 
you know, my friend just got attacked by a bear and they're going to die in 30 minutes, or I broke my ankle and I just can't walk out on my own, but I have my camping gear and I'm fine here for a day or two. Um, so a personal beacon, it's just an SOS call. Then you have a couple different kinds of communicators. So uh, Garmin inReach is one, a spot communicator is another, and a satellite phone is another one. So most of these will allow some form of two-way or a, a, a more nuanced communication. So with the spot beacons, you can send a preloaded text message saying, hey, I'm okay, but I'm gonna be late. Maybe I won't make it home when I thought I was gonna make it, but I'm fine. Or you can say, hey, you know, I need help immediately. Um, or in some of the newer ones, you can actually have just text message conversation. Um, and you can do that with the inReaches as well. So they're a little bit more expensive, but they're really great because being able to communicate is a huge advantage. You can also get weather updates on some of them. So uh, something to keep in mind. And obviously a satellite phone is maybe a little overkill for this, but if that's what you got, then, then that's what you got. Um, I think all of these devices are available at Mountain Shop from the PLBs to the inReaches and the spots. So if you're interested in checking one out, they would love to help you out with that. Um, just got a question, issues with phones dying as you're tracking your routes. Um, I mean, it certainly does drain battery. I know with my phone and I'm on a, an S10, um, you know, I can get through a full day tracking a route with no problem. Maybe it uses half battery, but everyone's phone is different. Some phones die in a couple hours. Um, so my suggestion is, you know, know your device, um, bring a backup battery if you're unsure, because phones also tend to die a lot faster when they get cold. Um, so if your phone's not working and you think it should, you can try and get it warmed up by putting it in a breast pocket or something. Um, but if you're unsure, bring a backup battery, you know, because everyone's a little bit different. I always bring a backup battery for my phone because it doesn't have much of a lifespan. The nice thing about the inReaches, um, I have a Garmin inReach that I use. I can track myself on it. I can also use it for navigation and it has a really long battery life. That's, those are some of the advantages to some of those devices. Yeah. Um, the last thing, you, if you do activate that device and you don't have two-way communication function, you know, if you just send out an SOS signal, stay where you are. Uh, please, please, please stay where you are, because when we come, we will be going to that location. And if you say, well, I think I can get myself out, or, you know, it's been four hours and you're getting tired of it and you're ready to start moving somewhere, you know, I, I sympathize with that. I understand it. Um, but we might not be able to find you. A perfect example was a, a rescue we had on Mount Hood a couple weeks ago. And a gentleman was coming down the south side and, and got lost and wound up somewhere to the west of Timberline. Um, he sent, a, sent out an SOS call and wasn't able to communicate anymore, but stayed where he were, where he was, and that saved his life. It absolutely saved his life because if he would have um, you know, left his location, he was in a whiteout, there's no way we could have found him in time. Um, so please stay where you are. Let's go ahead to the next slide. Oh, real quick, Saul, um, there is a question. Uh, I was under the impression that PLBs are more reliable in an inReach um, and that they've heard rescuers prefer two-way communication. Uh, if you have both, I would suggest carrying the inReach because yes, having two-way communication is incredibly beneficial to the rescuers. Um, we won't be communicating with you directly. And when I say we, probably not PMR. We usually don't go up to Mount Adams. It would probably be Yakima County. Um, but you'll be talking to the sheriff and you know they'll know all the right questions to ask. Um, I don't think PLBs are any more reliable. Uh, I think the, the spot beacons and the GPS um, or the, sorry, the spot beacons and the inReach, they use the same technology. Um, so yeah, I, I would totally trust those if you have them. I think they use the same satellite networks as well. I would imagine so, yeah. Um, yeah, so while we're talking about it, uh, Mount Adams does, at least the south route, falls under Yakima County Sheriff. The western portion, parts of it are under Skamania, but I think it's mostly Yakima. Um, they have a search and rescue team similar to function to PMR in Clackamas County. Um, 
They also have great helicopter support because there's an army base right there in Yakima, um, Pendleton, you know, even Salem or Portland if they have to. Um, but you can't count on a helicopter. It, it can get, the winds can be high, you can be in a whiteout condition, or it can be at night. All these things, they will not send a helicopter out. So don't think that, you know, just because you broke your ankle, you're going to get a nice helicopter ride out of there. It could be a long, bumpy ride on a, uh, a stretcher that is not comfortable. Um, but, you know, we do the best we can. So moving on, how long will it take? Um, I think our slide here, yeah, a typical Mount Adams mission. And so this isn't uncommon to even a Mount Hood mission. I know it seems like it's really close to town, um, but there's a lot of things to consider. And I'm not going to read through all of this, um, you know, just take a minute. But basically what we're trying to say here is from the time you make that SOS call to the time someone actually shows up, um, it could be six or more hours. You know, on Mount Hood, it's four to six somewhere um, because, you know, rescuers have to drop what they're doing, head out, um, head up to the mountain. And, you know, Mount Adams is a long way away from a lot of places. So just keep in mind that if you don't have two-way communication and you press that button, you're going to be sitting there for a very long time and it's going to seem like nothing is happening. Um, but we promise that it's happening in the background. So going on in the timeline, um, let's go to the next slide. So also keep in mind, you know, there's a lot of things that can impact how quickly we're able to get out there. Um, if it's dark, if it's in the middle of a rain or a snowstorm, if there's other hazards that would prevent us from getting there. Um, so again, if you have two-way communication, you're going to be able to get updates on this along the way. You're going to be in contact with someone, which is really, really reassuring in a situation like this. Um, but if you do just have a one-way communication device or you lose communication for whatever reason, just try and keep in mind if it's taking longer than you think it should, there could be other things that are affecting that. We didn't lose you. Um, and lastly, when the rescuers arrive, I don't think this is going to be an issue. Um, Paige, you want to jump forward? Yeah, um, they're going to take care of it. Just listen to what they ask of you. Um, usually the teams are going to be self-supported. Um, you're going to see anywhere from four to 15 people showing up um, and they're going to take care of it. So if they need help, help them out. Um, if not, you know, just be supportive of, you know, whoever your, your group member, your teammate, um, that needs help, just continue to support them like you have been doing, and everything's going to be good. Um, and I think we'll go, we got one last slide here, and then we'll track back on some of the questions we had. Oh, yeah. So the one thing that we do in our rescue groups that are also uh, really important to do in your recreational groups as well is talk about it after the mission or talk about it after your trip. What did we do well? What did we do not so well? Especially if there's an incident, what could we have avoided um, or what could we have done that would have avoided this issue? These are great conversations to have. It's the chance to talk openly, talk freely. If there was risks that you took during the trip that maybe you're looking back on it, you don't think you should have done, um, you know, keep that in mind. That's great information to have, and it's great information to discuss with your teammates, to discuss with your partners. Yeah, so, so open communication is really something to highlight. Um, and that's really it for our slide. So here, you know, take some time, copy down these links if you need to. Also, um, we can try and um, write some stuff into the questions. We want to get some stuff in into text form for you guys. Um, but road conditions are, you're going to find the road conditions on the UFSS site. They're going to tell you if that road 8040 is open, which now till the rest of the year it will be. Um, you can find the GPS track. So that one link, alpinesavvy.com, is a fantastic resource for anything climbing related in the Northwest. They have a, a huge database of GPS tracks for all of the commonly climbed routes in the Northwest, and it's all free. Um, so go on there, follow the instructions. You can take those tracks and you can download them into your phone and it'll tell you uh, 
it'll keep you on the route. And again, keep on checking on the route as you're going, but uh, yeah, highly recommend that. I use it myself all the time. Uh, weather, there's a number of different um, weather forecasts that you can use. Mountain forecast is one that people see a lot commonly, and it's nice because it tells you weather at different elevations. It's often wrong. Uh, it often paints a very rosy picture. Um, <laughs> it's so, wrong a lot. <laughs> yeah, so weigh it against other sources. Uh, NOAA, which is the, um, the government-funded weather agency, is a great resource. They have very accurate forecasts. They update them a lot. Weather.gov um, is NOAA. Yeah, yep. So yeah, highly encourage you to use a number of different sources and to kind of weight the average and you know, never rely on just one. Um, and also there's an avalanche forecast. NWAC is no longer forecasting this year, um, but if you do decide to go up in the winter next year or early springtime next year, check back to NOAA and uh, yeah, get the latest avalanche report. So I think with that, we're gonna hop into the Q&A here first and- Did you take over my screen? <laughs> I, I did not. Oh yeah, but this is what mountain forecast looks like. Oh, here we um, go. Got it. Are you, yeah. are you sharing your screen? I am not, no. <laughs> Interesting. Well, there we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah, so going into the Q&A, um, what equipment is recommended for skiers? So most skiers, if you're a proficient skier, you can skin to the top if you, you know, go later in the day when the snow is a little bit softer. So ski, ski crampons um, and a whippet would be great, or ski crampons and an ice axe is good. Um, if you're not as confident in your skinning technique, then, you know, crampons and ski boots work great too. Uh, I, think, um, I think it's a personal preference for uh, what you prefer uh, recommended for skiers. Some skiers really like whippets. I don't have ski crampons. I feel like if I need crampons, I'm just gonna take my skis off and put crampons on my boots. Um, I, I really think that any of these would be appropriate. Crampons, ski crampons, ice axe, or whippets. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you guys can see the answered questions in the Q&A, but the one I just answered was uh, which GPS or what was the GPS app? So there's three primary ones that we're going to recommend. Uh, Avenza is one. Gaia GPS is the other. That's G-A-I-A -A, and CalTopo. So if you can see the Q&A, um, you can see that in text form so you can copy it down and, and know how they're spelled. Um, but yeah, those are the, the three ones that we recommend. Also, yes, this session is going to be recorded. It's going to be available on PMR's YouTube channel. So if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel yet, we're getting it off the ground. But if you want to go back to any of this information, the whole thing will be there uh, in its entirety. And I think you can probably find that on Facebook too, on our Facebook page. Including the links we showed in the previous slide. Yeah. Um, here's a question, a question on altitude. <clears throat> I'm, I've heard of Coca tea. Has anyone had experience with dealing with altitude sickness by drinking coca tea? So I have. Actually, when I was in Peru, I hiked up to Machu Picchu. This was many moons ago. And I was drinking coca tea. And I'm assuming you're talking about leaves of the coca plant in the hot water. I wasn't sick. I can't tell you if I wasn't sick because of the coca tea or vice versa. But um, I, I found that it worked. So sure, try it. Altitude sickness can be kind of a major problem on this mountain because it is high. Um, altitude sickness generally occurs like 8,000 feet or higher. Um, and so that's why a lot of people spend the night on the mountain to try to acclimatize before they go up to that 12,281 feet of altitude. Another question is, how does this compare to Mount St. Helens and Hood? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're comparing, whether it's the search and rescue procedures or the routes themselves. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about the routes. Mount St. Helens is um, similar in length, I think, but it's not quite as high of elevation. Um, and the route finding is tricky. Hood is, again, not as high. The route finding, I believe, on the south side of Hood is way more straightforward than it is on Adams. Um, do you have any other comparisons, Micah, that you could think of? Uh, yeah, it would probably compare better to Shasta. Um, but oh. I'm guessing most people, if you're on here, you probably haven't been to Shasta. Um, 
Mount Hood is definitely, the south side of Mount Hood is definitely steeper than anything mm -hmm. you'll find on the south side of, uh, of Adams. And it, anything on Adams, the route on Adams is a little steeper than what you'll find on Mount St. Helens. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's a question just to clarify, crampons needed in summer or no? Like it, that's a hard question to answer because it really depends. Um, if you're talking about summer being August and September, probably not, but me personally, I would throw at least microspikes in my pack just in case you have to cross something that might be a little slick. I know that's not like a super clear answer, but you'll see people up there in running shoes. Um, I would probably not be one of those people because I'm a little more conservative, but that would be my answer. Even in the middle of the summer, I would at least throw in something that's got traction on it in case you can't complete the route without getting on snow. Yep, definitely want to bring some sort of traction device. Right now, you know, we had a question people are asking um, about, you know, now. I'd probably still think bring crampons if you have them, especially if you're first time. It's, there's no reason not to. They're not that heavy. Um, you should have, you know, boots or shoes that are compatible with them. Mountain Shop runs some. They're pretty cheap. Um, yeah, cheap, cheap insurance. It's good to have. Especially if you're starting early in the morning, even even it's not freezing at the summit, the snow will be hard enough that you will definitely need crampons. I have a really light pair of like aluminum crampons that work just fine, but I would wear something a little more substantial than micro spikes this time of year. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are asking too about, you know, now should we be climbing the summer or the winter route? I, you know, when we both went up recently, we were on the summer route. Um, winter route, you're just doing a lot of rock crossings at this point. You're on and off snow and it can get kind of annoying. Um, the summer route is is more consistent. So yeah, I think we'd recommend the summer at this point. And again, you know, talking about start times is, is tough. Um, if you're skinning and you're looking for a ski descent, you're probably going to be starting later in the day. So after 4 a.m. For, for a ski descent, um, I started at 4 a.m. and I descended around uh, nine, you know, eight or nine, that was too early. It was pretty teeth chattery for a while. It was real icy up top and I didn't get to decent, um, decent corn snow until, um, you know, almost at lunch counter. So we started down at noon and it got sloppy too fast. <laughs> yeah. Might say like 10 or 11. Right yeah, that's kind here. of that perfect window. And it, it might still be icy up top. I mean, you're going to find variable conditions because you're covering 3,000 feet elevation in your ski descent. So it's going to change. You can't wait until it's completely soft up top or else it's just a mess down below. Um, so it'll be a little firm up top. But, you know, at, once you get down the first 500 feet or so, it'll soften up pretty fast. Here's a question on altitude sickness. Um, do you have other recommendations on altitude sickness? Have had some success with Tums? Heard the point on hydration and fuel, anything else? Um, I actually uh, think that hydration is good. Um, I also have had success with um, electrolyte tablets, just making sure that you keep your electrolytes balanced. The best thing you can do for altitude sickness is to ascend slowly and methodically and spend a night acclimatizing. If you're worried about it, spend a night at lunch counter acclimatizing. Yeah. Um, because altitude sickness isn't, um, it can actually progress in a haven and haste. It probably won't, but it can ruin your trip, give you a terrible headache, make you feel really hungover, awful. Um, so just slow, steady ascents. If it's your first time, you know, don't try to charge up the mountain in three hours. Yeah. Overexerting yourself can exacerbate those symptoms. Yeah, if you're really worried about altitude sickness, we'd recommend breaking it up into two days. Spending a night at lunch counter, that's that's going to be your best bet. Um, timing for lunch counter to the summit, then down with crampons glissading. If you're walking up and down from lunch counter, I would say start around five in the morning. That way you can be at the top probably like eight-ish. Yeah. And then... Um, eight or nine ish and then should be okay to glissade by then and definitely okay to walk down should be decent yeah. stepping by then see any other questions uh micah i don't i don't think so yeah if there's anything else um go ahead yeah. put them in asking if we would be able to share the deck what does that mean the slide. So again, this entire presentation is going to be recorded. It's going to be on Facebook. We're not going to share um, just the file itself, but yeah, this, this will be up there. Um, we have gone through all the slides. So if you need to 
um, jump around a little bit and find the information you're looking for. Um, yep, go ahead and, and we'll try and make sure it's on our YouTube channel by tomorrow. Um, just got a question, what's a good time to head up the lunch counter on day one? There, it, it really doesn't matter a whole lot. It's probably going to take you about four hours, I think we said, to the parking lot to lunch counter. It's a heavy pack, um, yeah. Yeah, you know, you're not, it's, it's pretty easy travel. You're not really going to see a whole lot of steep terrain. Um, you know, noon is fine. Um, I like, like to start early, get up there, early, set up camp, relax, yeah. kick back, yeah. enjoy the view, you yeah. know. Yeah, so pretty much whenever. Um, just don't head up too late. There's no reason to get up there and set up 10 when it's dark and other people around you are trying to sleep. You don't want to be that person either. Um, so yeah, noon, a little before, a little after, you're just fine. Was there another question on the Q&A? For some reason, I can't open the Q&A, but. Uh, no. Uh, nope. So, other than that, a uh, huge thanks to the Mountain Shop for allowing us to do this and for supporting us. And, you know, hopefully any of you guys, uh, if you're looking for some gear, highly recommend the Mountain Shop. If you have more questions, you know, they will be more than happy to answer your questions on gear, answer your questions on the route if they need to. You know, they can put, put you in touch um, with someone else who, you know, who would be able to answer questions. So yeah, I think that's all we got. Uh, Liz, anything else? Nope, that's it. Thanks guys. This has been awesome. Thank you. Oh, and thanks everyone for tuning in. We had like 60 some people, so. That's Super good. Cool. Thanks guys. Thanks for taking the time to do this. And yeah, stop by the mountain shop if you need any gear. <laughs> all right. All right. If you guys awesome. don't have anything else, that's it. I'll see you guys later. See, ya. see you guys. Have fun. Be safe.